What's up, everybody, and welcome back to Fireside Giants. I'm your host, Anthony Rovardo, joined by my co-host, Alex Wilson. And the New York Giants have resumed conversations with Saquon Barkley, of course. He's on the franchise tag. They haven't made much progress on a long-term extension. They stopped talking for a little while, but they're talking once again. It sounded like last week the offer was back on the table. Then Ian Rappaport had to clarify it's not back on the table, but they're talking about putting it back on the table. So kind of important news, but also expected. There's still a month until that deadline, July 17th, is when the long-term extension needs to be signed. And if there isn't one, Saquon Barkley has to decide, will he or will he not play on the franchise tag? So, of course, we're going to go ahead and discuss the Saquon Barkley contract negotiations in this episode, but we also want to talk about Wink Martindale and some fantastic quotes that he had about the secondary, talking about having two good corners is how he described his defense now. So kind of throwing the defense last year under the bus, but also saying what we all know, the Giants didn't have two good corners on their roster in 2022, but now Wink Martindale is confident, and I am confident that they do, in fact, have two good starting outside cornerbacks, Adoree Jackson and Deontay Banks. So we're going to dive into those two topics today in this episode. But before we do, make sure to leave a like if you do enjoy this episode. Subscribe to the channel if you are new. Ring the bell so you don't miss an episode and comment your thoughts on the topic down below in the comment section. And if you're listening on Apple or Spotify, please make sure to leave us a five-star review. And go ahead and follow us on Twitter at Fireside Giants and follow us on Instagram at Fireside Giants. Always providing you with a daily New York Giants content on those social media platforms as well. Without further ado, Alex, how are you doing today, my friend? And what are your initial thoughts on the Giants and Saquon Barkley resuming contract discussions at this point in the offseason? Look, man, I'm great. And Saquon Barkley, the it's going to be interesting to see how this unfolds, man. I honestly, I could see them finding a fair ground and extending and it being like a good compromise. But I could also see them saying, you know what, play it out on the franchise tag. We don't need to sign you. If you don't play, you're giving up 10.1 million of guaranteed dollars. And nobody in their right mind, I don't care who you are, you're not giving up $10 million guaranteed to sit out and hope for a long-term deal, especially the way the running back market is going. Saquon's backed into a corner, and that's like the unfortunate reality of his situation. Um, you know, he came out and said publicly, whatever they're saying about me is untruthful. I did not ask for an insane amount. I'm looking for a fair deal to, to uh, kind of just get my worth, get my value, and he thinks he deserves it. And honestly, based on the way that the Giants have utilized him in the past, he would deserve it if the Giants weren't going in a different direction. And that's kind of where things get a little bit murky. The Giants are going past heavy. Um, they bring in guys like Jalen Hyatt and Paris Campbell and Darren Waller, certainly suggesting they are going to be throwing the football a lot more. Saquon Saquon's target share is going to reduce and decrease, but Saquon Barkley commands a lot of attention. If you're an opposing defense, you cannot leave the man alone. You have to have eyes on Saquon at all times. Getting less touches is actually a good thing for Saquon because it means he's going to stay healthy longer. Last year, we overfed him. He got hurt, neck injuries, you know, shoulder, and he was not the same the second half of the season. When we needed him most, he was just out of gas. Like, we just really ran him into the ground because we had no other choice. But now you got a lot of mouths to feed, and Saquon Barkley can stay healthy and be an impact player when we need him most. So I feel like keeping him is an ideal scenario, and he's going to play for the Giants in 2023 unless he's traded, which is very unlikely in my opinion. I think they want him to be there. And clearly, management, I mean, you look at the owner, John Mara. He's literally said publicly, I want Saquon to be a Giant for life. Way to throw your general manager under the bus there, John. But I'll say, I'll tell you what, you know, Joe Shane's like, I don't really care. This is a football operations. I'm in charge. I have the final say now. They've given me carte blanche, and I'm not going to make any premature decisions. And ultimately, it's the right thing for the Giants in terms of financial, um, you know, kind of allocations. They're taking it easy. They're taking it careful. You know, they, they're not doing what Dave Gettleman did in the past, and then he just made wild signings with no backup plan, with no care for the future. Every, every single decision the Giants have made up to this point feels calculated. It feels like it's part of a bigger plan and a bigger strategy. So right now, I feel really good about where we are. I feel good about this process. Do I feel like we've disrespected Saquon a little bit? I absolutely do. And I, I wish we could find a really fair compromise that would make both sides happy. But that's easier said than done because, like, you know, every player wants to get paid their maximum worth. And Saquon may be asking for a little bit more than the Giants are willing to give. And, and it's not about year over year salary, it's about guaranteed money. How much guaranteed money are the Giants willing to give? Well, look at this season. They're willing to give $10 million to him um, in 2023. 
Maybe he wants a little bit more uh, like security than that, but maybe that's all they're willing to do. So ultimately, the Giants have to make a big decision, but at the end of the day, they don't really have to make a big decision if they don't want to because they have the franchise tag and Saquon Barkley is not going to give up $10 million and he has no choice but to play really well for the Giants if he wants to leverage that one year into a long-term extension. Joe Shane holds all the cards, um, so it's kind of like in his wheelhouse, like what does he want to do? And it's about loyalty, it's about that family culture, it's about leadership, it's about cult, it's about the locker room. Um, there's a lot of variables that Saquon impacts, and I know a lot of you guys in the podcast and, the fr- and you know friends of the podcast really want Saquon back, and I'd love to find a fair deal ultimately at the end of the day. But, you know, Anthony, what are you thinking about the situation right now in terms of where Joe Shane is sitting? He has all the cards, he has all the leverage, he doesn't need to budge. So Saquon's going to be the one that has to come down. Yeah, I do think that the Giants and Joe Shane hold all the cards in the situation. They have all the leverage, but I will say if they don't have Saquon Barkley this upcoming season because he chooses not to play on the franchise tag, I think that does have a pretty adverse effect on the New York Giants locker room. And if they don't give him the contract that he wants, they don't satisfy his contractual needs, it might have an effect on the rest of the players in the locker room because Saquon Barkley is well I wouldn't even say well-liked. He's well-loved in the locker room, and he's a leader, and he's friends with everybody, somebody that everyone in that locker room looks up to and in some ways glorifies as being the best player on the team. So when you think of it from that perspective, is it in the best interest of the New York Giants to trade Saquon Barkley or let him walk? Probably not. They are trying to build a culture. They are trying to build a family in that locker room. Shipping away Saquon Barkley over money is going to send the opposite message to the locker room than the one that they've been building and trying to send for the last year and a half. So I think that that's an important variable to throw into the mix here. Yes, the Giants have a lot of leverage, but Saquon Barkley has leverage just by being a good guy, by being well-liked in the locker room. He has leverage for that because you don't want him to walk away and have that tear apart the culture that you've spent over a year building in that locker room. Saquon Barkley was a huge part of the success last season. The Giants made it to the postseason. They won a playoff game. They want to go ahead and do that again. Whether the fans think so or not, the players absolutely believe that Saquon Barkley was a huge reason why they won that playoff game, why they made it to the postseason in the first place. So without him in the locker room, it's going to feel a little bit different for them, and they might waver in their confidence just a bit and feel like maybe the Giants slighted Saquon Barkley in a way. So I do think it's important for them to at least handle this situation with the utmost care and respect to Saquon Barkley. They said he's felt a little bit disrespected. I think that's something that the Giants are going to want to remedy as soon as possible. He should not be outwardly saying or publicly saying that he feels disrespected because that could have a pretty bad reaction in the locker room. So I agree with you the Giants have more leverage here but I wouldn't sleep on how much leverage Saquon Barkley possesses because of the importance that he has to the locker room's culture so I think that's something that deserves a little bit more attention in this conversation ultimately I think Saquon Barkley gets a contract extension he's probably going to have to sacrifice a couple million dollars in order to sign with the team but I think that the Giants are going to understand the importance of signing him for the culture of the locker room, and he's going to understand the importance of signing with the Giants because there's not really much of a market for running backs elsewhere. I don't even think the Giants would be able to trade Saquon Barkley if they wanted to. I don't think that there would be many takers out there who are willing to spend the money on a running back. So it's a complex situation, but hopefully it does get wrapped up before that July 17th deadline. Until then, we're going to be focusing on the Giants practicing, not until training camp, but once they're practicing, practicing in training camp, we're going to be be keeping a close eye on the secondary because that's a positional unit that I think has a lot of room for improvement from last season, but it looks like they have improved quite a bit, notably with the addition of Deontay Banks. First round cornerback, 24th overall pick in the draft. I love that selection. He's an athlete. He's great in man coverage. He's physical and aggressive in press coverage. He looks like the perfect fit in the Wink Martindale defense, and so far, so good. He's looked good at OTAs, looked good at minicamp, and Wink Martindale sounds impressed. Alex, what are your thoughts on Wink Martindale's impression of Deontay Banks after OTAs and minicamp, and what is your impression of Deontay Banks after those beginning practices? Look, Deontay Banks is a freaking athlete, guys. We haven't had an athlete like this, a cornerback, in a very, very, very long time. We actually may have never had a player this athletic at the cornerback position. He has the third highest athletic score of any cornerback in the last decade. 
You know what I mean? Like, you t- I remember, like, Cromarty, superior athlete. Like, I loved that dude so fast. I mean, Janoris Jenkins wasn't the best athlete in the world, but he was agile. They all had their strengths. I think DRC, though, was probably the best side that we've had in a long time. Deontay Banks is better th- in, in terms of athleticism than him, in my personal opinion, just based on the scores. The scores suggest that. The score, you can't, you can't get over the scores. You can't get over the scores, man. But I'll tell you what. Deontay Banks missed one tackle last year. He was one of the best coverage corners in the entire draft class. We got him at 24th overall, as you guys, of course, know. Wink Martindale loved this player. And, and this is what Joe Shane had to say about it that really stood out to me. And I was like, wow, like they really wanted this guy. So on the Giants huddle, Joe Shane essentially said um, he was obviously super excited. This is Wink Martindale about Deontay Banks. And it's something that for his defense, that's very important, having two good corners. So with Tay Banks and Adoree, I think the defense has taken a little bit more shape in terms of what he wants it to look like. But Tay Banks was one of his favorite players in the draft. And we were, when we were able to get him, he was obviously very excited. My back is still a little bit <laughs> sore from the bear hug he gave me. Look, guys, Wink Martindale is one of the best defensive coordinators in football. If he has an affinity for a player like this, you know he's damn talented. You know that Deontay Banks is damn talented. So I'm really excited to see what he can do on the football field because Wink Martindale seems to love him. And we've seen Baltimore in the past with some elite cornerbacks, Marlon Humphrey. You know, you see Marcus Peters. You see so many great players across the years. Um, you can't really ignore the fact that the Baltimore Ravens have been tremendous at drafting corners, and they've gotten so much production out of them. And ultimately, the Giants are trying to replicate that same type of thing. And Deontay Banks has all the qualities you want. So I really hope to see um, that athleticism bleed onto the football field. But him being a CB2 to start his career is exactly what you want him to be. You don't want him being a CB1 immediately. You want to give him the time um, to kind of transition into the NFL and go up, go up against those WR2s and whatnot because Dory Jackson's capable of traveling. But I do really think that that developmental year, that first rookie season, is going to promote him into a CB1 role. If, and if it's if it doesn't, the Giants can go out and sign somebody because that contract from Dory Jackson will be coming off the books after this upcoming season. So, you know, looking at Deontay Banks, Anthony, what do you think his role is going to be in terms of um, kind of how they utilize him? I think that we're gonna go, we're gonna see a lot more of Wink Martindale's roots. The second half of the year when we didn't have a Dory Jackson, they played a lot more zone coverage than we were normally used to. I think we're gonna see a heavy man coverage scheme, barring any injuries. You know, knock on wood. But this system fits exactly what the, the talent that we have on the roster now. You know, you got a, a really good tackling linebacker in Bobby Okereke. You have a really good defensive line with really good interior run stoppers now and a lot of good depth there. You have really good cornerbacks. You have a really good free safety. You know, the strong safety position is still up for grabs with Dane Belton as a Wink Martindale guy. Remember that. He's a hard-hitting, strong safety. And, I, and he was injured last year. You know, how are you feeling about the, the kind of well-roundedness of this defense in terms of, like, it feels like we're taking a big step forward here and we may not be kind of recognizing it as much as we'd hope to. Well, listen, I think that the Giants are taking a massive step forward and one that's a little bit slept on because they have a really tough schedule coming up and I wouldn't be shocked if the Giants are on paper just as good as they were last year, maybe even a game worse in terms of the win column, but a better team overall, a more suited team for the postseason just because they're going to go through a gauntlet in this regular season. They've got a really tough stretch of away games. They've got a lot of really talented teams on the schedule. So it's going to be a tough year for the Giants to squeak out those wins, but they have a better roster, a much better roster. We're not even going to talk about the offensive side of the ball as much in this episode, but even on the defensive side of the ball, they really did make some improvements. And not only do they have two good cornerbacks, I'd argue that they have more than two good cornerbacks at this point because they added some depth to the position that I think is also getting slept on, which is cornerback Amani Oruwarie, formerly of the Detroit Lions. Now, he was terrible in 2022. There's no way around it. He was just pitiful with Detroit this past season. But the year prior, he was viewed as one of the best young corner cornerbacks in the NFL. He had six interceptions. He was a stud with Detroit in his third season, really fell off last year. But I think that change of scenery in New York with a a defensive coaching style that really fits his playing style, you know, this defensive scheme, this man-heavy aggressive scheme, Amani Oruorie could have a really solid bounce back with the New York Giants this year. So I think that's important to note because yeah, he's a backup right now, but I do think that there's a chance he gets some playing time. Dory Jackson has not played a full season and at, at any point in his career, I don't think. So he might be off the field for a game or two, and that's where Amani Aurore steps in. But I feel way more confident now in the depth that the Giants have, and their secondary is my main point here. Trey Hawkins as well. So I think when you look at the depth in the secondary, 
that's really important that the Giants bolstered the cornerback spots. But again, talking about Deontay Banks, the athleticism that he possesses and what that means for Wink Martindale and what he's able to do with the defense, well, it means a whole lot because you're right. Wink Martindale got away from what he traditionally likes to do towards the second half of last season. He was able to return to form in the postseason with a Dory Jackson back in the lineup. He had a Dory Jackson follow Justin Jefferson, man match him, and that was incredible. That performance out of Jackson, it shut down Justin Jefferson and it propelled the Giants to win a postseason season game but before that the Giants had to play way more zone than they were comfortable playing and that had an adverse effect on their run defense on their blitz packages it really was a top to bottom issue for the defense it changed everything for Wink Martindale but now having two man press cornerbacks on this roster three if you do consider Amani Ruorier in that mix if he's able to bounce back but having those two starters in Banks and Jackson it will allow the Giants to really just rock with their man coverage play as aggressive as they possibly can and hopefully Hopefully that will be the catalyst to even more success this upcoming season. Look back at Wink Martindale's time with the Baltimore Ravens. He had Marlon Humphrey and he had Jimmy Smith and he even had Marcus Peters at a time. Those three cornerbacks, they all thrive in one particular facet of the game and that is press coverage. Now the Giants have two, maybe three, maybe four if Trey Hawkins develops. They have a few cornerbacks who are really good in press coverage. So Wink Martindale is going to be more comfortable calling the defense that he likes to call, that defense that works best for him. And ultimately, we should get some really impressive performances out of some of these cornerbacks, namely Adoree Jackson and Deontay Banks. But Alex, before we wrap here, when you're looking at Adoree Jackson, Deontay Banks, but then those players behind those two, what do you think stands out to you as a guy that maybe develops into something? Or if he does get put onto the field, you think that he could surprise some people and contribute some quality snaps? I mean, look, I love to see Trey Hawkins. I mean, he has that frame. He has that build to be an NFL corner. He just needs reps and experience, you know, coming from a smaller school. But I'm going to stand out there and say Aaron Robinson still a guy that I have a little bit of faith in. Like, I think Aaron Robinson, the freak injuries he sustained has completely derailed his career. If the guy is healthy and he serves as kind of a reserve, I think he could be an impact player. And I also think that Nick McLeod is a decent reserve too. Um, you know, he performed well when they asked him to. And I think that, you know, I wouldn't overlook him – um, you know, kind of fighting onto this roster and, and, st- and, you know, snagging a roster spot and being a reserve at the cornerback position and being a fine reserve at that. I, I think that the Giants have a little bit of depth at cornerback and depth that has experience in Wink Martindale's system now. So I certainly am excited to see what happens. Deontay Banks and, uh, you know, rather um, uh, Cordell Flott, that's a guy that I would love to see get more opportunities, whether it be in the slot, whether it be as a first reserve. Um, we're going to see kind of how things develop. But look, if Cordell Flott ends up as a good backup, That's fine for me. You know what I mean? If he ends up as a starting slot guy, even better. I think that ultimately we have some good depth, some good developmental talent, and I'm really optimistic about this secondary moving forward. Listen, as am I, and I think, you know, we didn't even touch on the safety spot. I think there's a big hole there, of course, at strong safety, but the Giants have some young players there that could absolutely rise to the occasion. Javarius Owens, Dane Belton. There's a lot of young talent in this Giants secondary, which is what really excites me. And I think that Wink Martindale has found a bunch of guys who fit a particular archetype and a skill set that he can deploy onto the field and hopefully propel the Giants to having a phenomenal defensive season in 2023. But that pretty much wraps this one up. Make sure to leave a like if you did enjoy this episode. Subscribe to the channel if you are new ring the bell so you don't miss an episode and comment your thoughts on the topic down below in the comment section if you're listening on apple or spotify please make sure to leave us a five-star review and again follow us on twitter at fireside giants follow us on instagram at fireside giants daily new york giants content for your social media channels right there without further ado we will catch you all in the next one have a good one and let's go giants (music) 